Thank you, Thierry, for the kind introduction. Uh, a very good morning uh, to everybody um, and uh, a uh, warm welcome uh, to our distinguished panelists. Um, as uh, as Thierry was saying, uh, we effectively are now sort of um, in a very interesting uh, phase of development uh, in uh, the financial sector. Until recently, um, money has uh, and payments had you know only sort of relatively little to do with the digitalization that uh, that went on in in our lives um although digital payments already been emerging slowly uh, along traditional bank transfers and cards um things su uh, such as the uh, the PayPal accounts that we all have or the NFC chips on our mobiles, which are turning them into mobile wallets. Uh, it wasn't until really sort of Bitcoin hit the scene that we thought about money and digital digitalization. And even then, back in 2009, it was, it, it was a bit of a novelty. Um, now this novelty is worth um, a breathtaking almost $20,000 a pop. At the same time, uh, blockchain or this ledger technology emerged, which is now a technology that is seen potentially fun fundamental and transformational for a lot of areas in finance. Since 2009, we've seen over 7,000 um, new coins being issued after, after Bitcoin and a staggering $500 billion uh, are invested in those coins. Out of these coins, by now, 1,800 are thought to be dead. So they're no longer around, they're no longer being managed, and perhaps people have lost significant amounts of money. Then, back in June two, uh, 2019, so mid of last year, Facebook emerged and uh, presented their proposals for a Libra project, effectively a privately organized global payment system based on the uh, blockchain technology and on digital coins. So this is in our first, uh, and effectively this is the background uh, to the recent discussion um, between regulators and legislators that has informed in uh, September of this year, a very sweeping initiative by the European Commission presenting proposals for a variety of um, legislative pieces of legislation uh, to regulate this new and emerging sphere. So this is what we're discussing in this panel today. And I'm welcoming uh, three eminent pan panelists. I've got with me um, Andrzej Kovacic. He's a member of the European Parliament for the Renew Europe Group. He's a member of the Econ Committee, um, and he's very closely involved in all of the recent discussions regarding digital finance and the digital finance agenda uh, of the EU. I've, I've got with me uh, Eli Beruti. He is the chairman of the European Payment Institutions Federation and uh, a vice president of American Express. And I've got with me uh, Wolfgang Ringe, He's a professor of law and finance at the University of Hamburg and a visiting professor at Oxford University. So welcome to the panelists. I would like to start off this panel with um, a general question to, uh, to Andre. Against the background of what we've heard, all of these coins float, floating about, which are or are not yet mainstream payments, uh, uh, instruments of payment. Uh, against uh, the Libra proposal, which by now is still a proposal. What was the rationale for the EU and the EU institutions actually to now start considering to regulate these crypto assets? What does this Mika proposal, Mika being the markets for uh, markets in crypto assets regulation, what does this Mika proposal really mean? And why do we need it? Andre, please. Thank you, Christian. Good morning. Uh, I hope you can hear me, see me well. Everything's working fine. Um, thank you for the invitation and thank you for the debate. I think it's a 
It's actually a very good question because we are currently uh, in, in the debate where we sort of take uh, the proposals from the Commission uh, for granted and we're discussing technical details, but uh, I think it's actually good to uh, take a step back and, and see um, what, what is actually in the background of, of uh, uh, such, such a proposal and, and such, such, such as a decision. I wouldn't say it's, it's, it's completely a new thing, you know, that it's sort of a, like a lightning uh, coming into, into the legislative uh, environment. Um, I think if we you know, get back to 2017, where uh, there was a, a huge increase of, of uh, uh, market capitalization of, of Bitcoins and, and uh, the real like, bull run um, in, in, this, in this area, uh, already there, there was a, there was a clear, uh, I think, um, idea of, of actually sort of exploring uh, how uh, these trends and new instruments appearing in the market um, should, should be treated uh, in, in, in the regulatory framework. And uh, we already had uh, back in 2018 uh, an action plan uh, proposed by the European Commission, which uh, uh, sort of uh, prepared uh, uh, background for, uh, for some further uh, work in, in this area. And, and I think we also had uh, uh, in, in the Parliament uh, earlier this year debates and, and preparation of, of uh, our initiative report on specifically on crypto assets as a reaction to uh, not only what I, what I was mentioning earlier, but also uh, uh, to uh, what you have mentioned. And that's, that's the Libra initiative, which is actually uh, circling around uh, for some time at this, at this point. And I think uh, the key is, ac is at this time to identify uh, crypto assets uh, to clearly uh, sort of define uh, the, their, their, their nature, the, 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 the way these instruments are, are, are working, um, the, the way that the markets are organized, uh, the way the service are provided, uh, the, the issuers uh, questions, and actually to find out whether uh, on the national or, or European level, we have a regulatory framework that is already uh, prepared and ready for uh, those kind of instruments or not. And I think this was also one of the results of the consultations that the Commission was leading uh, throughout this year, a uh, number of, of uh, debates and fora all over the, all over the 27. Uh, and the result was that, that there is actually a part of, of the market that has no uh, regulatory framework. And, and this is something that also for, for us in the European Parliament um, was a point of concern uh, from the point of view of consumer protection, investors protection, the way the markets are organized, uh, the sort of interface between the crypto markets, uh, crypto assets markets and, and the regular financial instruments and the financial institutions that are uh, at this point regulated. Uh, so I think these were all the reasons why uh, th there, was, there was a lot of debate on how to uh, address that. And uh, uh, here we are uh, with, uh, with the Commission proposal on markets and crypto assets and, and uh, the, the work of co-legislators uh, being started. Well, thank you, Andre. Uh, so um, we're, we obviously sort of are not, as, as, as you say, so we, it's, it, it, it didn't come out of the blue. Um, what uh, is the industry perspective of this? Um, Eli, um, some people obviously have uh, great expectations as to uh, these crypto assets and, uh, and the DLT technology and how it could change and revolutionize payments. Now, your constituents clearly, they cover pretty much all of uh, the, uh, the new as well as the emerging payment solutions. Uh, how do they look at, uh, at, at these crypto assets? Um, what is their view? Does, does the, uh, does the uh, this new initiative uh, help or hinder new ways of, of payments? Christian, first, first, thank you very much for, for the invitation. And, and maybe if you allow me maybe to have very short statement about EPIF for those maybe who are joining us today and who are not familiar with, with EPIF. So EPIF is the European Payments Institutions Federation. So we do represent um, payment institutions, electronic money, you know, um, providers across the, the, the EU. We're, we're the biggest non-bank uh, association in the in the EU. So as, as you rightly mentioned, we have members um, that, that, that could go from, from very big players, you know, you could think about, you know, American Express, about Western Union, about PayPal, um, Amazon Payments, um, a lot of merchant acquirers and so on, 
to really like uh, three-party, you know, payment providers. Um, we have, you know, Trustly, um, Klarna, and a lot of, you know, s- s- small players as well. So a, a very diverse um, membership. And why am why I started there? Because you know, as as Andre, you know, mentioned in the beginning, the issue of of crypto assets, and then I would say DLT, distributed ledger technology, is not a new topic, you know, for for, for us. Um, what really brought it, I would say, um, and, and it became very, very topical as such, was you know the Libra announcement and what Libra and Facebook were, well, what Facebook was planning to do, um, and 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 the announcement that actually changed the whole, I would say, atmosphere across across the globe. And I'll go back to this in in a minute. So from 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 our side, um, as 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 payment as a payments industry. We do see actually the value of, of crypto assets and DLT, you know, with the potential to revolutionize payments. I mean, we can go into again more details why, you know, and, and maybe this the, the, the continuation of, of the discussion. Um, why? Because it's a disruptive technology, and then it has, you know, the potential is is, is really significant. Um, DLT, they, DLT uses independent computers to, to, to record, share, synchronize transactions in their respective electronic ledgers. While, you know, the traditional um, payment institutions and, and banks, they keep data centralized as in a traditional ledger. So um, this is a, the, the potential is huge that, that, that is proposed, I would say, by, by, by the blockchain technology and, and, and DLT. Now, Having, having, I would say, looked at, at the potential that, that, that this technology could influence and is influencing you know, the payment sector, the other question I think that Thierry also um, mentioned is, you know, what about consumer protection? What about you know, anti-money laundering um, objectives and anti-money laundering checks that you know, all financial institutions, including payment institutions, need, need to be making? And this is where, you know, un- un- until until um, the Libra project, we were, you know, all the organizations were looking at at, at these technologies and trying, you know, to, to take advantage of those um, in, in the way we are making payments, especially in the cross-border world, I would say. Um, but now the most important part that then, you know, was, was raising the question is whether first we should keep, you know, um, having these players not regulated, which honestly we don't agree with. We do believe in in, in, in regulation because, you know, as, as Thierry mentioned, we believe in the same business, same risk, same rules. This is a very important, I think, um, very important principle that, that we need to, 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 to keep respecting as an industry. Um, then, so we, we, we are favorable, I would say, to, to, to what Mikar is, is trying really to, 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 to achieve here. And then always, we should always not forget about you know consumer protection what happens is something goes wrong we always you know think and want you know to take advantage of innovation and you know what what any what any actually um financial innovation is providing but we need to think what happens if something goes wrong so this is the consumer protection angle that is important and that's why you need a regulated entity second, the second piece is is anti-money laundering and how you are able to make sure you are complying with your obligations um, from, from an AML perspective, which is also very, very important. Now, maybe if you allow me, I, I'll conclude saying that, yes, you know, the MECAR is, is very important um, as, a, as a piece of re- regulation, but let's not forget that um, we might also need um, to, 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 to review, for instance, MIFID II um, in the area if, if, if we talk about, you know, security tokens and so on. So maybe for payment tokens, utility tokens, I mean, un- under MECAR, this could be addressed in a way, but then other pieces of, of, of legislation in the EU might need to be reviewed. And again, MIFID II is, is, is one, one great example. Great. Uh, thank you, Ali. Um, a, uh, a quick note to, uh, to our audience. Uh, you are, uh, um, we will have an, a Q&A session after, the, uh, after the, uh, these first exchanges. So when you have a question, uh, either to uh, an individual panelist or to the panel as a whole, please do use the Q&A um, uh, instrument uh, on, your, uh, on your desktop. Uh, and if your uh, question is directed to a particular panelist, then please do um, mark it uh, in, your, in your question. 
Um, Georg, uh, so we've heard uh, from uh, from the industry that uh, there is there is readiness to see uh, uh, to see this emerging sort of new uh, new sector uh, regulated. Mika obviously, you know, has now had uh, is is on the table. It has a has had a, a certain gestation period. Is is it is now entering the institutional um, dialogue. Now, um, from the perspective, from your perspective, um, uh, being part of the broad land regulatory landscape that, as as, as Eli was saying, in includes MIFID, includes uh, PSD, uh, is 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 the MICA proposal useful? Does it does it uh, strike a, a proper balance between the objectives that it's it's sort of purported to to serve, like consumer protection, legal certainty? openness to innovation, etc. Good morning, Christian, and thanks so much for having me. It's great to contribute to this debate, which I think is fascinating and ongoing. And really, Europe is somehow leading the debate in the world at this stage, which is really fascinating to watch. Now, well, the question you're putting to me is probably the, the tricky one, right? How can it, how can Mika achieve everything at once? And um, how can it achieve legal certainty? How can it protect consumers? How can it be open to innovation? It's basically like squaring the circle. And I guess um, there's a tension between those three different goals that it, you know one of them might lose out. It's almost impossible to achieve both things at the same time. I think um, Mika is is great in providing legal certainty. And in fact, you know, come back to, to Andre's starting point, this is the, the first best reason why we have this project, right? Because a lot of the new technology does not really fit into the existing legal framework that we've developed over the I mean, you know, MIFID was developed during the 1990s and 2000s when the technology we have today simply was not on the horizon. So there was a lot of doubts on, you know, what applies to whom, and there was lots of arbitrage possibilities. So all of this um, requires a new legal approach. And I think we're all in agreement with that. And, and the uncertainty is the first best selling point for this new framework because it provides clear and broad definitions, and it allows this passporting principle that uh, and many other pieces of legislation are successfully using in that context. I'm also optimistic as to consumer protection because, you know, because of this clear new framework, you know, at least provides legal clarity for all sides. One major asset, I think, of the Mika regime is also that uh, these new markets will be subject to the market abuse regulation, right, which is a, a, a major improvement and I think will boost confidence in those markets. Um, another good point, point, I think, is the strong power of the European supervisor authorities. There is really a step up in, in, in supervisory powers here. And many, um, many providers of those new services will be required to have a legal presence in the EU. So all of this, I think, sounds quite an, as an attractive package to me. The question mark, Christian, that I would put to, to, to the question that you gave me is the openness to innovation point, right? Because uh, if you are too strong on the legal certainty field, then you may risk addressing, you know, that, that, that we're not fully up to speed when it comes to openness to innovation. And, and using these very broad terms, these, technology, these very broad definitions that Mika proposed to you, are positive from a perspective of making them future proof. And I think this is what the European institutions want to achieve because we want to have this framework, not to update it every six months, but we want to have it future proof, right? That's why they have these very broad definitions. Um, but it may be uh, somewhat backward looking, right? It may be uh, addressing the technologies that we've seen over the last years, like ICOs and electronic exchanges, uh, but not so much looking uh, to the future, and it may also be a little stifling, in particular for startups and new ideas that may be coming into uh, the field. Uh, I think there is a political story here going on, right? And we've already hinted at Libra, so th th there is a political risk here that we might overshoot it. So, all in all, I would hope that the European institutions, and I'm, I'm speaking to Andre now uh, immediately, um, might uh, experiment with maybe more innovative ways of lawmaking instead of you know having the traditional toolkit of a fully fledged regulation which will then be adopted and will stay there forever for the next 10 20 years or something uh, but there are more 
you know, dynamic ways of addressing problems like regulatory sandboxes, like experimentation spaces where we can learn, right, in a dynamic way from a very fast developing industry. So that's, I think, something where the EU could do much more in sort of living up to the challenge of, of constantly catching up with new developments in the, in the field. Great, thank you, uh, Georg. Um, so uh, here is a, a, a sort of a, uh, a plea for um, having sort of opening up to experimentation and, uh, you know, having having let sort of less uh, less uh, prescriptive regulation uh, regulatory approach um, clearly sort of a lot of the a lot of the uh, uh, the thinking as you rightly say sort of comes from or is, in, is informed by uh, what we have seen in the market so far and um, uh, the the Libra project is clearly sort of a very significant one that sort of shapes some of the thinking um, so Libra and the stablecoin uh, concept uh, is clearly something that uh, you know is at the moment first and foremost in, in the minds of regulators, and perhaps also something that really intrigues uh, the general public because it seems something that is quite accessible, that is some, uh, that is innovative, uh, an electronic re representation of money. Um, uh, the, my question would be to uh, to, to Ellie here. Um, the proponents of, of the stablecoin concept, effectively, you know, um, they they bring up a lot of of, of potential of potential advantages. Um, financial inclusion, as Thierry was saying in the in, in the beginning, uh, effectively, sort of putting money in the hands of people who uh, don't have a bank account, addressing sort of the the large unbanked population. Um, global reach, um, being able to uh, to make payments across borders um, or make remittances uh, in a cost of, in, in a cost effective way. Um, con convenience. Some of the uh, the constituents uh, of of, of uh, EPIF were were in fact uh, members of the of the Libra project initially. So from from the perspective of your constitu constituents, Ellie. Uh, what are the what what are the real benefits or drawbacks of, of of a stable coin from a from a user's point of view? Can you can you give us a sense for where the value lies from 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 the perspective of a consumer? That, that definitely, definitely, Christian. And, and I think again, um, here it, it's it's it it would be wise, you know, to to maybe check what Libra has has announced first, because I guess that's that's the elephant in the room, right? This this is what what triggered most of 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 these discussions and what led from, from my perspective at least to the to the Mikar proposal. Um, so there are inefficiencies in payments, especially when we think about you know the cross-border world. Because let's look at at, at you know the the um, the situation as it is right now. Right now when you are trying to make you know um, a transaction again cross-border and by cross-border I mean mainly out I mean from the EU let's say to outside the EU so to Asia or, or to or to the US or to and any other country or to Africa, um, it is pretty expensive and it takes a lot of time. But why this is the case, you know, because you have to use traditionally when you're making, you know, these these um, international payments, I would say, you need to use either the banking sector and then you have to use the correspondent banking, you know, um, I would say um, construction or you would use, you know, the international money remittance companies. In generally speaking, you know, um, and, and this is known for all those who know the industry, you know, when, when you are when you are really trying to reach areas, I would say in Africa and Asia that are a bit remote, you would use, you know, in general, the, the, the money remitters, like the ones like Western Union, MoneyGram um, and, and the others. Why? Because, you know, the banks in Africa or in, in, in Asia are concentrated in the main cities and not, you know, in, in places that are a bit remote. So you, you have this need. So in, in, in theory, I would say um, what, what is proposed here by, by Libra, for instance, or all the others is to say, why do we need, you know, to rely on all these intermediaries? Yeah, let's cut off intermediaries, you know, whether I mean, and have borderless payments. So to be able really to, to propose directly, you know, these payments to those who need them, whatever they are. 
it's 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 very I would say sexy and important because it is addressing one major concern that that exists right now. The second one is low fees. It's another advantage that is proposed there. Saying again, because you are cutting intermediaries, because you know the cost of having agents, maybe in the case of of the money remitters, if you cut these, you know, less intermediaries, meaning you know less 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 money that would go, you know, uh, to the to those intermediaries, and then the consumer would benefit at the end of the day from lower fees, faster transactions. Again, we, we would be using the internet. This would be instantaneous. And then you wouldn't need, you know, to wait from a correspondent bank to be waiting and then, you know, to clear, you know, um, a transaction, etc. So this is this is another this is another, I would say, uh, advantage and maybe a last one. It would be transparency because we're going to use, I mean, in, in the blockchain. So these are public public blockchains. And so you have, you know, better transparency. Uh, every user will be able to monitor um, you know what, what what's going on, which is honestly impossible for those who who try to 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 transfer money via a bank from one one country to another. Sometimes you don't know what's going on. The money is is lost somewhere, or at least it's it's waiting for some checks. So these are the potential, I would say, advantages that that stable coins um would would give. Now let me also maybe mention very quickly two risks of why this is also like disadvantages or, or you would have question marks to ask. Well, first would be, you know, the centralization, I would say, risk or the concentration risk, because in the majority of cases of these stable coins, you would have one player or one, you know, provider that would be somehow concentrating all this power that then, you know, could, could then have an impact, I would say, on, on financial stability. And that's why regulators across the globe, you know, have have joined forces somehow and, and, and we're pushing in the same direction. And, and the other risk, which hopefully in the EU will be addressed via, via MECAR, is the lack of regulation. And again, I mean, to a point we mentioned before, what happens to consumer protection in case, you know, um, the money didn't, you know, uh, arrive where it, where it should be. And for me, that's why users, I think, would be, yes, excited, but what what really users want, and this is based on a lot of, you know, I would say data that our members have shown is the trust in the system, because to give you one concrete example, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll close there, you know, some questions were asked and, and I'll mention one particular example. It's for Western Union in, in the market. It is known as a little bit more expensive, maybe than the others. And then in a lot of data that was that was, you know, done and, and, and studies to show why do consumers you know use still use western union while there are other alternatives and the main question is trust in the system when you have someone who is sending you know 50 euros or 100 euros and this is all what they have they want to send to their families in africa or in asia they want to trust they want and they, they need to believe that the money is going to arrive you know to for to the family at the other um, part of the world and and trust is very very important and that's that's still, you know, something to, to be seen if, if there would be in the near future any application here. But again, I think the regulation is a very good step towards, you know, increasing this trust. Thank you, Lee. Um, I think we've we've now sort of heard several times that, you know, uh, the uh, uh, there is there is a, a framework out there. There is a framework out there that sort of uh, tries to establish a legal um, sort of legal certainty for these new instruments. There is also, as, as Eli was saying, demand for these new, new instruments potentially. Now, um, uh, the new instruments that are being uh, put forward by uh, by uh, by Mika and are being defined in Mika because Mika is all about taxonomy. Um, and about trying to categorize these instruments without categorizing too much, without excluding, uh, without excluding something that we don't know yet, but might be sort of might be coming up. Um, the this sort of uh, tightrope walk that Mika is is is, is trying to perform uh, obviously so it takes place in 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 the bigger in the bigger environment of. The existing regulations, and a few of them have already been mentioned. Um, again, Ellie mentioned uh, the MIFID, so the market in financial instruments. Financial instruments are specifically carved out, in fact, of MICA. 
but the, the, the categories that are defined in Mika um, are sometimes very, very difficult to, uh, to uh, delineate against the financial instruments that are already quite extensively regulated elsewhere. So um, my question to Andre really in this in, in this respect, are you are you happy with um, this the, the way uh, Mika performs the tightrope walk? Um, there are on the one hand very tightly regulated instruments in there, specifically where the stable coin replicates uh, an EU currency one to one. The moment it goes away from that very narrow concept, um, it becomes very, very vague. Um, there is a, uh, an instrument defined in Mika, the asset reference token, which is defined in a very, very open way. Um, so what justifies this really sort of very, very different approach? Uh, are you happy with that? Do you think that is what legal certainty and consumers want. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, maybe um, if I if I may, one quick remark to uh, uh, Georg calls on, on a more innovative way how to uh, uh, approach the, the, uh, the, the leg legislation. I, I, I fully agree. And I think if, if you look at our report, uh, we were calling for uh, sandboxes and users, even pan-European sandboxes, actually, or, or more, more uh, uh, general use of, of them in, in order to exactly in order to promote uh, uh, this more dynamic exchanges between regulators, legislators, uh, companies, you know, uh, so that uh, the, it's, it's not this fixed concept of a uh, regulation that is adopted and is, and is with us for, for the next decade, but it's also in, in, in the way in the way it's uh, applied and i think um if if you look at the commission package um to a certain extent the dlt pilot regime is is a sort of a i think attempt of uh, uh trying to propose something that that uh, you know should serve also as as uh, as you know maybe a new way how to approach the existing legislation um on on, on your question christian uh i think uh this is this is again. We were discussing this very very uh, very much in detail, and and obviously, if my my my, my understanding is, if if you approach um, let's say a new landscape uh, with a, a sort of a attempt to to regulate it, it's 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 actually essential to start with you know identifying the the real matter and the subject uh, of of the future regulation, and. Um, I think we realized, and, and the Commission basically is the same. There is already a number of instruments that can be already classified as as, as covered by by the existing regulation. We were talking about MIFID II, PSD, uh, Electronic Money Directive. I, I think you know that there is there's a number of of uh, regulatory uh, uh, rules that are already in place and can be used uh, on on uh, on some of the some of the uh, crypto assets already already in place. Uh, I think the the idea was to identify whether there is uh, you know, other part of, of landscape that has no that has no rules at all. And uh, indeed, what we called in, in our report, what we, we wanted to start with the taxonomy, as you mentioned, uh, an open ended, because we, we, we definitely are regulating something that may be not be existing at this point. So it should be open ended. Uh, it should be EU wide so that we have a sort of a harmonized approach across the EU. But also, uh, it should be uh, it should be sort of um, um, detailed enough. And this is the question I, I think where, where you're heading uh, with, uh, with with Mika. And uh, when I when I saw the, the proposal and basically see, you know, we have the utility tokens, we have asset, asset reference uh, tokens, we have e-money tokens, and then we have all the rest. Um, to me, it's it seems that maybe it lacks a little bit a little bit of granularity in it because uh, like like this, it can actually encompass a number of issues, but uh, but also not. Uh, at the same time. Especially for for the asset reference uh, tokens with uh, with a significant uh, with that potential significant uh, uh, impact on uh, financial stability and and uh, as, as Ellie mentioned you know the let's say the groundbreaking initiatives that can actually uh, uh, shape the entirely shape uh, in a new way the, the markets and, and and the way the financial uh, services are provided and financial transactions are, are carried out. Uh, 
there is also a proposal in Mika for a, for a bespoke framework uh, for uh, for such a such a significant. So I think this is this is a sort of way out. It's I think it's very general because I mean we we don't know exactly what what that would mean, uh, but but I think at the same time. Um, in 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 my reactions to to the proposal is that maybe we can look a little bit more into different categories of of crypto assets and and see uh, in a little bit more detail the the way we categorize them so that we are actually able then to differentiate better uh, the way that we should approach them and and this is something that uh, uh, in in my view will be also uh, in heart uh, in the heart of, of the discussions uh, among among legislators uh, at, at this point and I'll, and I'll be I'll be definitely happy to uh, to to go more into details uh, when when the negotiations start because I think that is an important point because it's basically the way we we uh, approach the entire the entire uh, ecosystem of of crypto assets. Um. Thank you, Andre. Um, I've, I'm already seeing sort of a couple of uh, a couple of uh, questions um, uh, appearing on the Q and A. Um, so please do uh, feel free um, um, to uh, to send us send us your questions. Um, uh, there is there is one uh, interesting angle that we haven't we have only marginally uh, sort of touched upon, but um, I would quite like to. Uh, to to bring it up um, because we've said uh, Mika is quite a quite a, a, a unique in, uh, initiative insofar as the EU sort of is trying to regulate something that other other jurisdictions have so far been more reluctant to do um, and they um, uh, clearly sort of some of the jurisdictions in Asia in North America obviously sort of are very closely connected to to us in particular in, in, in the financial field and in digital services so um now that europe is sort of making the step forward um, to uh, to try and regulate something that is so closely uh connected and intertwined internationally and where european authorities european institutions would end up trying to uh implement those regulations um my question to Gail would be, um, you know, uh, is this, um, how, how do you see this attempt in a way to, to regulate um, uh, from, the, from the EU um, globally to, to, to create sort of extraterritorial, as they say, um, jurisdiction to, to regulate tokens that non-EU entities um, would originate, would issue, um, and that would then be used in the Euro European markets. How do you how do you go about regulating and enforcing these things? And is the approach in Mika realistic? Gil, you've, yeah. you've got the floor. So, sorry, <laughs> was that the question? Uh, yes, I think this is a fascinating fascinating point. Look, I I think there is um, both grounds for optimism and skepticism. So the optimistic version would be. Look, Europe is really now shaking up this field here. As I said before, we are the first mover, uh, and, and that may be an advantage. In, in particular, when we talk about stable coins, looking at other parts of the world, the United States is, is very unclear, right? Many pieces and bits and pieces are regulated on the state level. So there's lots of different versions within the US, and there is sort of uncertainty, uh, that key problem. Asia is very restrictive towards uh, stable coins right so i think there is an opportunity for us there's a window of opportunity now for europe to, to to make that step um but at the same time as you rightly point out what we're trying to do is to make a first mover uh for something that affects the world right and we may, may run into enforcement problems if we try to impose our european standards to players that are located somewhere else in the world um and uh don't forget that we are talking here about as something that is highly global, um, highly borderless, right? Um, even more extreme than the internet or other technology areas. So it may be very hard to really give way to this. On the other side, you know, we've done this in the field of GDPR. Uh, the data protection regulation was also something where everybody predicted at the beginning, how can Europe insist on this tough standard? And, uh, you know, will this not um, lead to the consequence that everybody else goes to other parts of the world. Well, the fact is Europe is big enough to be uh, sort of 
such a big market in the world that many players are now adjusting to and, and even considering the European standard as the best practice. So in that respect, I'm mildly optimistic, I think. I'm mildly optimistic that um, the European standard may influence the world dialogue, will somehow be gold-plated into other parts of the world, uh, and, and, and then ultimately overcome the enforcement problem that you've been talking about, Christian. Um, let me just, uh, if you allow me to make one, one point, because we've been talking about stable coins in general, that the greater fear that I see is that this field is heavily politicized. Uh, stable coins in particular, I agree with, with Eli that this, this project, the Mika project, has the name Libra written all over it, right? I mean, the, uh, there, there is a tension between creating these opportunities, being great, being the first mover, and then at the same time being restricted because we see Libra as the big threat to the sovereignty of the euro. Uh, and we want to somehow uh, find, find the wall, the Chinese wall against um, those evil, um, uh, systemically important stable coins that threaten us. So, so my perspective on that is stable coins, if anything, are less of a problem than the first generation cryptocurrency. You know, I mean, think about uh, Bitcoin or Ether, uh, uh, how volatile this was, right? It, 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 it wasn't really a currency in that sense. It was high, highly speculative all the time. And the stable coins are doing a lot to address those problems, trying to address consumer protection, reduce the chance of gambling, uh, and have many other advantages, for, you know, for example, reducing the transaction costs to payments worldwide. So I think um, the direction that the Mika regime is taking is somehow at odds with that. And, and the risk is here that we are making a political move, which doesn't necessarily reflect all the economic realities. Christian, may, may I just intervene very quickly also on this? Ilya, yes, please. The floor is yours. Wonderful. Right. Um, it, it, <clears throat> I, I think to answer your question and, and you know, um, participants, can, can look at what was published as of yesterday, actually, the Bank for International Settlements, you know, the BIS, um, issued a working paper on, on stable coins. And this is exactly, I mean, it's, it's very interesting as you read, because then you could check <clears throat> so how, you know, this, this international body is looking also at, 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 well, at, at MECAR and what Europe is, is trying to do. And, you know, compare and do this, 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 I would say, game of comparing, you know, how much they are going in the direction of what Europe is trying to do, how much they are deferring. And it, it gives you a little picture about, you know, I mean, how the world could be moving there. Um, I would slightly disagree with, with, with Georg, I mean, on, on, on the comparison with, uh, well, with GDPR, because here when we think about stable coins and the cross-border element and nature, it's, it is, well, jurisdictions are too much, you know, relying on each other. We cannot just, I mean, we cannot just say like in Europe, we're going to do something and then expect that all the rest of the world is going to follow. Um, I, 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 I'm somehow, I'm, I will be a bit more cautious there. That's, that, that would be nice if it happens. Um, but then I would be a bit more cautious there. Thank you, Elaine. Um, We can't hear you, Christian. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> it is, I think, anyway, now uh, time uh, to give the floor to uh, the audience, in fact, um, and to uh, to uh, re react to a few of the uh, uh, to the questions that uh, that come from the audience. Um, I have. Um, I have two questions that uh, that I think sort of uh, um, talk about certain aspects of the Mika regime, uh, and one more general question, uh, or two more for, uh, more general questions, in fact. Uh, one question from the uh, from the audience: uh, Could all of the panelists uh, share if they have, and to what extent they have? I'm, I would I would assume experience with stable coins, permissionless crypto assets, and uh, distributed finance or decentralized finance as it were um could we just sort of do a little tour the doubler uh perhaps for everybody to to to, to briefly sort of uh, give their exposure to uh, to these things um who would who would like to start <laughs> uh 
but I can say that I'm I'm doing research on these things, right? I'm not part of the industry myself, so I'm not personally involved in those things. Uh, I have the luxury of looking at this from a, from a research design. Thank you. I mean, <laughs> happy to go to go next. So. So here I, I could say like again I'll maybe answer from the EPIF perspective and maybe from from American Express. So from from the EPIF perspective, as as most of you know, we have some 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 members that have publicly actually um, you know made it clear like they 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 want to allow cryptocurrencies um, on their networks or to be using that. And and if, a very prominent example is PayPal, I would say, um, who is a member of EPIF and. Who again um few 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 weeks or month ago you know he they they made it clear like this is something they are looking looking there and this is actually increasing also i would say the credibility of the crypto assets market in general um as amex we have had some some projects actually um with with ripple um to, to address one one particular concern for cross-border payments for um for, for for more the corporate world um, but yeah, we're, we're looking into that. So, so these are probably two two practical examples. Uh, yeah, for, to the audience. Yes, uh, to 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 finish, um, I have to say that uh, in in the European Parliament, we 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 still don't have any any European Parliament uh, crypto asset, any token that can be used for. Um, uh, cafeterias or, or something like that, but I, I hope that we can actually move forward in this in this regard. Uh, as, as, as for myself, uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm a rather very conservative consumer. I, I used to have uh, fractions of, of bitcoins and ethereums in, in my wallets as, as, as a fintech fan and using a number of, of services that are appearing in the market, but uh, uh, I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm, an, I'm an experienced expert in, the, in this regard, but I think there, there's, there's a way forward also for institutions such as the European Parliament. Great, thank you. Uh, so um, another, another question that um, uh, that um, comes generally, uh, so it talks generally about the uh, the financial inclusion topic, which clearly is something that's close to our heart. Um, we've got the, the the question is effectively sort of how DLT technology um, could generally sort of, as I understand it, could uh, could. Uh, create opportunities to improve uh, financial inclusion, in particular in emerging markets. Uh, that would be sort of my, the general question. And I would quite like also to perhaps, uh, if uh, one of the panelists, I'm thinking perhaps Eli, uh, want to touch on existing initiatives that are perhaps not a DLT um, in, uh, to, to increase financial inclusion in emerging markets, such as for instance, MPESA. Uh, and sort of try and kind of compare and contrast with uh, what these things can do. Um, I'm happy, happy to take that uh, the, that one, Christian. And and I'll start with Mpesa because this is, if you want, the 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 great example that 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 is often mentioned. I mean, I, I'll maybe give a bit of background for those who are not familiar with with what Mpesa is. So this is an initiative um, in in Kenya. Um, mainly in Kenya, it was also tried you know, in, in Tanzania, if, if, if I'm not wrong, um, where you know you could you could transfer money via mobile mobile uh, wallets and, and using really you know your, your your cell phones as such to to transfer money, and a lot of uh, I would say a lot of th this is a very successful initiative, yeah, that 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 that, that what, what was made with Safaricom, um, particular company, and and that was possible because of interoperability among you know networks and mobile networks in Kenya where it was possible actually to do that in, in, in a very easy easy manner um, and this is this is helpful why because again it is addressing the challenge that I raised you know first it is you know very big countries very I mean a lot of remote areas with really not 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 many financial infrastructure you know in, in, in Africa and in Asia and in particular so this is a great example where um, based, I would say, on, on again, the, the mobile mobile network technology and mobile network operators being interoperable. And I think interoperability is, is one word that we didn't maybe hear here enough today in our discussion. And this is usually, you know, a huge challenge when it comes, when, you know, when we talk financial inclusion, 
it's interoperability of different systems that, that could work there. So this is another, another uh, I would say, example on how you could achieve financial inclusion. Again, if you have the right ingredients in place, but the challenges or where we are starting from, the challenges remain, remain the same. And that's again, big areas, you know, remote areas with little financial infrastructure in place in those countries. And the challenge is how you can, you know, bring the money to those who need it in a fast, cheap, you know, and, 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 yeah, and, and, and convenient manner. So definitely M-Pesa is, is and, and that's why, you know, again, DLT is, has this potential because as I mentioned before, the technology itself, you know, it, it, it could permit, you know, faster transaction, lower fees if you cut intermediaries and then borderless payments, you know, also using and transparency using the blockchain. So, so sorry, maybe I'm repeating myself here, but that's, that's a bit how, how I see it. Can I, Thank you. Can I just Gerd, add, uh, Gerd, please? One quick point. So I think, as we've said before, I think the great hope is that Mika will um, boost confidence in the market, right? So it will add confidence for consumers to engage with those new financial products that we're talking about. If, if we have a strong supervisory power in place, if we have the market abuse regime applying to those markets and all those things that will help right, consumers to trust uh, those markets. And that will not just be coming back to the extraterritorial point, Eli, I think, you know, that that will then, as soon as you want to target the European market as a provider, you must expect those things to operate in those markets. And therefore, I think it will not just be a confidence for European consumers, but even to consumers in other parts of the world that are, are trading in those global markets. So, so therefore, I think that is a step absolutely into that direction of financial inclusion. Uh, Andre, did you want to address that point as well? Um, I'm, I, I fully agree with uh, what, what has been just said. No, I was actually thinking, obviously, I mean, th th there is this potential, uh, but there is also uh, a risk that, that we, have to, we have to be aware of and, and we, we, have to, we have to sort of, uh, you know, identify clearly. And uh, we, were, we were talking about, you know, the access to bank accounts. We were talking about uh, obstacles and barriers e existing in cross-border uh, transactions be it on on the eu but especially on on, on the global scene uh, I, I think well these are these are all um, reasons why uh, you know maybe some uh, people will will tend to use uh, innovative products um, in order to access those services because at this point uh, they may be too difficult to to access but at the same time uh, i think by doing so, uh, they should be aware that there is a there, there is a number of risks, and I think uh, that, that was mentioned. It, it's a it's a question of trust, but also I think we, we see in the world very very uh, you know special uh, uh, special trends uh, in countries like uh, Zimbabwe used to be like like Venezuela today with a high inflation, so very low trust in a local uh, state currency. Uh, you can see people, you know, just leaving for for digital uh, digital solutions in uh, RTM uh, in Venezuela as as, as, a, as a trading platform where people exchange digital currencies, uh, you know, gaining uh, uh, in in power. So I think I think you know there there are there are uh, sort of cases, study cases where where you can see that uh, there is a potential for for the digital technologies to to um, enhance the, the, the inclusion and, and, and uh, facilitate the access. But I mean, we have to always bear in mind uh, some, some risk that uh, may be linked to it. And I think that that is also one of the, one of the issues that should be, that should be dealt with uh, when, we, when we talk about regulation in this regard. Uh, I think there is, a, there is one, uh, first of all, sort of the, uh, the uh, issue of currency substitution that you, uh, that you just mentioned. We're going to, uh, to address that in the next panel. So, but this is very, very important and significant because clearly sort of if in a country like Venezuela, you are trying to use a currency that is not the official currency of the country, um, from a government's and central bank's point of view, that raises huge amounts of issues. Um, uh, picking up on, on uh, some of our uh, other questions from the audience, um, and this comes back to the question uh, to, to the matter of trust that uh, Ellie has mentioned uh, mentioned a bit earlier. Um, the concepts that are being floated uh, by uh, clearly Libra and uh, and other operators is that 
uh, they would provide a stable coin that either is referenced one to one against an existing currency, um, which is one uh, matter that is quite strongly regulated in Mika, or to a basket of different currencies. That was the original approach of, of Libra, where effectively they, uh, they chose basket comprising the likes of the dollar and the euro and, uh, and other key currencies. Uh, the question from the audience was, to what extent, um, in particular, I guess, in the latter, um, but in both cases, to what extent can users actually have trust in a privately provided stable coin uh, to actually serve as this reliable means of payment? So, open question to, uh, to, to the panelists. Who wants to go first? I can step in. I see Ellie is actually... Uh... Uh, thinking about it, no, I, I think um, it, it's a very good question, and and this is exactly about about the trust, um, and I think it sort of also goes into the discussion that we have on the international dimension of it, and I think what should be the key principle for us uh, is that uh, we have a number of let's say principles that we you know tend to respect in the European legislation, and uh, is also sort of uh, already. Um, weighted by 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 the consumers, by by companies, because that's the, they are part of the of the of the of the regulatory and business environment in, in Europe, and this this includes the consumers on, on investors protection. So we we are trying, and I think what Mika is trying to do as well is actually set uh, set uh, you know a set of requirements on on, on disclosure on 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 you know on the on the way the 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 particular crypto asset is, is operating, and so so that the, the there is awareness uh, from both consumers and 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 uh, uh, investor side whether whether to use or not uh, obviously I think um, if, if you are talking about the crypto asset as a separate separate environment you know uh, uh, there obviously uh, the this trust uh, would, would be a key key issue and and I think it's also about the issuers to 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 make sure uh, that the conditions and and uh, the architecture and the structure is done in a way that uh, uh, the the consumers can use it because otherwise I mean what what would be the sense what Ellie mentioned a number of issues that make potentially use of such stablecoin very appealing because they, they can be easy to access and, and you know you, you basically send you, you can send a, a whatsapp message and and you know and your payment is done but uh, is it is exactly you, you want to send for example large amount of, of, of money uh, you know for payments for for um, uh, let's say your your, your important investments uh, for for buying a car for example you know, is is that the way you, you want you want to proceed? Is that the way you want to you want to uh, you know uh, get your mortgage and, and and pay for it? I think I mean those are the issues where uh, there would be a number of consumers. So I mean we, maybe we can speak about you know small retail payments that can be done very fast and and you know so that so that they are they are not burdensome. But I think if we speak about about large transactions uh, that that obviously uh, the consumers will, will will raise those issues. And uh, let me just uh, maybe mention one point we also addressed this in in the parliament's report because we we had a discussions about you know how the stable coins can can be can be treated and we we basically asked for uh some some of the safeguards being uh a convertibility of, of the stable coins back to fiat currencies at any time you know with the clear uh conversion rate at, at the issues like that because this is something that's you know sort of may create a, a you know an, an anchor if you want uh, the, the the potential crypto asset to uh, to the financial transaction and financial systems uh, as we as, as we know it um christian I'll, I'll be much 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 briefer um you know because i think andre you know address address the, the 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 issue extensively but for me the degree of trust because i think this is this is this is the essence of the question would depend on the need you know, the consumer need that, you know, the stablecoin would be there to address. So if, if if you would believe like you have no other alternative but to go for this one, I mean, in some examples of, of, of failing states, I would say of failing currencies, as Andre mentioned beforehand, then maybe we'd say, okay, well, I, I need to trust it because maybe that's the only alternative. I mean, again, I'm just putting a bit more th theoretically. Then you, you could say, like, why do people trust Bitcoin right now? You know, I mean, because the need they are trying to address is more, you know, to to 
to go out there and then you know to 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 speculate and then trying to win money. It's an investment product, so that that's why they trust it. I mean, again, it would depend what you are trying to achieve with each one of those. What what the consumer need you're trying to address. I think the degree of trust would depend on on this, and for sure the fact that these players or at least those that would be regulated. The fact to know, like again, from a consumer perspective, if something goes wrong, I have rights. I think this is this is key. This is key to 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 really grant the trust in the system. Great, thank you. I mean, this is this is actually a very very key question, and it um, it it relates or it ties back to perhaps the last question of this session. I'm mindful of time, but um, there is one uh, there is one. Uh, Sort of last um, complex of questions from the audience that addresses um, how the how Mika and how the proposed uh, um, regulatory framework would uh, would address uh, things like issuerless um, uh, crypto assets uh, or things like permission uh, permissionless crypto assets in the decentral decentralized finance space. So things that, um, in in terms of a of a model, look more like a Bitcoin than a Libra. Um, I think the core question here uh, is is one that uh, you, Andre, and Eli just uh, just touch, touched upon, which is whether or not you look at this as a means of payment of, of actually making your your everyday payments, small or big, or whether you want to invest or speculate. But that would be kind of my uh, my uh, um, my my initial thought. Um, please comment. Floor is yours, Andre. Thank you. Uh, I think I think that that that's also one of, one of the challenges of the regulatory approach because you usually you know uh, need to have a an interlocutor and partner uh, when when you when you want to. So also um, enforce legislation, uh, but I think uh, in in this regard, uh, what what my approach would be, and, and I think it's it's sort of also reflected in in in, in Mika, it's uh, it is about um, you know the the significance of of uh, such an asset. Uh, is it is it uh, the, you know the the size, the the, the volume of of, of a transaction, obviously. Uh, if it's if it's something that is circulated among a number of of uh, uh, experts or among a number of of closed community, uh, then then you know the, its significance is is uh, definitely lower. Um, if it's if it's just uh, you know uh, if if it's something that that grows um, in, in in its um, acceptance and in in its uh, um, in its usage. Then, then obviously it it uh, it has to have a, a, a you know some some sort of a, a, a regulation uh, compliance. But uh, this is I, I think exactly one, one of the points where where I mentioned that you know maybe need a little bit more details in 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 in, in the way that the the categories in the Mika are defined and where you know how to then approach approach those issues. And and uh, this I think is is uh, is an important thing. Obviously, uh, if at the same time, if you if you if you are not able to get exactly the issuer as 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 a, as, as a legal person, for example, or a private person, uh, there's always a way, for example, to uh, uh, to uh, um, put some requirements on 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 the trading infrastructure on 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 on. Um, uh, uh, the, the exchanges, uh, platforms, on 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 basically those who are who are providing services uh, when when using those those kind of assets. So I think I think there there are ways, but I mean in, indeed uh, th there are challenges that are linked to it. And and in, in my view, it would be it would be uh, definitely um, there would be merit uh, actually in in looking into the categories we have in Mika so that uh, it's it's defined properly based on on various types of of uh, assets that are circulating as well. Right, good question. I think um, Georg somehow addressed this, this this issue beforehand, saying very quickly that if you go too strict, and this is you know if it's 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 more you know to Andre and his colleagues, and then the council, you know how they're gonna look at and, and finally shape Mika because right right now it's 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 not you know um, published in the official journal, so we're just this we're only discussing I would say the proposal as such. So the parliament and the council can can also reshape it if, if they if they feel uh, 
necessary. But I would say if they, if you know, the co-legislators would go too strict and then making you know the regime, you know, too 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 hard, you know, for 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 providers, you know, to to to, to also use, then they would somehow. Well, this would have an impact on, on innovation and technology, and this could drive, you know, to answer the question, maybe, you know, more, more, more players to, to, to be unregulated again with, with, with the with the consequences that that we might know. So, yeah, let's it's, it's, it's a balance to find. Honestly, it's not I don't want to be in their shoes. It's, it's, it's a difficult uh, place because then you need you need to strike the right balance. And then depending on the regime that you will end up with, then regulators will be enforcing it. So honestly, I cannot answer right now how enforcement is going to be done on a piece that is not finalized yet. But again, I think the only the only balance to keep in mind is how much you know restrictive you want to to go, and this would for sure have an impact on innovation. Thanks, Eli. Uh, I'm uh, mindful that we're coming to the end of our um, uh, allocated uh, time. Uh, I uh, would quite like to uh, um, to thank our uh, our panelists. Many thanks for uh, your very very interesting and insightful uh, comments. Um, that was incredibly uh, incredibly uh, interesting, and I think the uh, discussion and the questions from our audience were also very stimulating. So thanks everybody for that. Um, we would uh, quite like to give everybody the opportunity to take a little break um, and grab a cup of coffee. And uh, I hope uh, have everybody sort of back um, at 10.45 in half an hour uh, for our second panel. So many thanks everybody um, and a round of applause for, uh, virtual applause as it were, for our panelists. <laughs> Thank you. Just join Christian to, to thank you for this fascinating panel, uh, super discussion. Many questions are open, but this is only the start of the discussion. So uh, a great thank you to all of you and um, to the people you know, to, to the people following us. We're reconvening in half an hour. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye -bye.